at the end or at the beginning, some of y'all be snagging more than one. Amen? Amen. So we want to honor all of our mothers today, and we believe that you are the bomb, and we mean that. And so come on, uh, come on, I feel like Oprah. Come on, bring the gifts out. Amen? Come on, bring them out. We want to bless all of our mothers today, and we're going to give you, actually, it's, uh, it is handmade a lip balm, amen. You can't go wrong with lip balm. Come on, hey, just give it out. Give it out to mom. Listen, raise your hand if you're a mother. Come on now. Make I want to try one. Come on, hand, hand me one. Amen. Anthony, where are you going, Doc? Yeah, let me see what kind. Hold on, stay right here. Oh, that's watermelon mint. Give me another. Give me. Give me. Here, try another. Hey, Amen. I got chocolate peppermint. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you don't like it, you can trade it. You can trade it. You can't take two, though, unless you're the pastor. Praise the Lord. We want to bless you today. These are amazing by uh, Lynette, Lynn's Bath Boutique, who comes to our church. Amen. A little shout out to her. Come on, give it up for Miss Lynette. Amen. Mm -hmm. So when you run out, you know who to go to. Watermelon mint. Hallelujah. Mother's Day. Today, I want you to go to the Gospel of John. I used to preach a Mother's Day message. It didn't go well. Ladies looked at me like, you have no clue what you're talking about. I tried to get my wife to come up and preach on Mother's Day. She told me, I do this. She said, I do the singing, you do the preaching. I said, I'll do the singing. She said, nobody wants to see that. Amen. <laughs> Just teasing. She didn't really say that, but she kind of implied. So, so. I stopped preaching Mother's Day messages. I, I'm just going to continue on in our series today on the Holy Spirit. So I want you to go to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I'm just checking out this water. I really want it. Can you open that? I want to try it out. Gospel of John, chapter 14. Go there with me. And this is Jesus talking. Remember, these are the last words of Jesus before he goes to the cross. Watermelon mint. Oh. That's good stuff right there, man. Don't hate me. Amen? That's good stuff. Amen. Mmm, that's good. Sorry, y'all. I'm a little hungry, amen? Watermelon mint tastes good. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another. Everybody say another. Another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I need you to underline that. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore but you will see me because I live you will also live and on that day you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you and whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them all this I have spoken while still with you and then I want you to keep on going I kind of moved down a few verses I went to 25 you could see that but the advocate the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do, I do not give, you to, give it to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Powerful words of Jesus talking about this parallel of ebb and flow of the role of the Holy Spirit. Father, today we love you. I just ask you that you would just do what only you can do. That you just anoint me today to be able to communicate to the people of God. God, let me be able to just hone into the realities that people are facing. And be able to speak life and speak truth. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Today, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. And as I think about this idea we talked about last week about the Holy Spirit is the revealer. 
And today I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit is the comforter. How many know God wants to give you comfort today? When I talk about comfort, I think it's important that we recognize that sometimes we have a misdiagnosis of what the word comfort means. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But Jesus is getting ready to comfort his disciples because he's telling them, I'm going away. This is the very same verse where he says, I go to prepare a place for you. For where I am, you will be also. You understand what I'm talking about. And Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus is giving a word of comfort today, and he wants us to know that he is with us. And I started thinking about my life. I started thinking about growing up. And truthfully, it's very rare for you to have a best friend that you stick with all your life. You know what I'm talking about? Like, who has, like, your like early childhood or preschool BFF is still your BFF today? Like, praise God. That's like two of you. The rest of us, we weren't that blessed. You know what I'm saying? Because we just, just life changes. You know what I'm talking about? You move, you transition, you go different directions. And, and um, you know, growing up and as a kid, I had my elementary best friend. My elementary best friend was like three houses down. You know, we played together. That was back in the day in the 80s where you, where you hung out and you knew where you hung out because of the bikes. It was in the front yard. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? And so we would put our bikes, our bikes in the front yard. We would play basketball. I'm from Indiana. We played basketball all the time. We played wiffle ball. Come on, somebody. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Wiffle ball? I mean, through a nasty slider, curveball. You know what I'm saying? We had our own little game set up. You know what I'm saying? If, it, if you hit the ball and it rolled through the grass and into the, into the street, it was an out. But if you, hit, if you hit it in the air and it landed in the street, it was a single. There was a, if it went across the, double, the, the line, the double line, it was a double. If it went over all the way to the other part of, to the other, completely other side of the street, you got a home run. We had this whole game set up. I don't know if it was our rules or if it was like a wiffle ball association rules, but we loved wiffle ball. Come on, somebody. I'm sorry. I'm just rem reminiscing, okay? Me, but as you grew up, you know, we, you know, you know, as we grew up, he was like my best friend. I went to probably eighth, eighth, ninth grade. And then my cousin Mark, who was always a good friend, he became my best friend. You know, we hunted together. We played together. We went to church together. We backslid together. You know what I'm talking about? You know that friend, like you, you in with God, and then you like you go out, like you oh no, I'm going out. You know what I'm saying? So we, had, you know, there are all kinds of things that we did. We can't talk about. It's under the blood. I'm not going to testify about all the sins I've done. When people ask me, "What did you do wrong?" It's under the blood. Hello, right? It's under the blood. Come on, turn your neighbor and say it's under the blood. I mean, it was under the blood. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and in high school, you know, here's a lot of stuff you thank God is under the blood. Thank God they don't got iPhones like they had in the 80s and 90s. Thank you, Jesus. I don't got no evidence. Thank you, Lord. Now you guys, now you grow up and you got all these cameras and photos and all this stuff. Y'all in trouble. It may be under the blood, but it's, it's Google's got it. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Then I had, then as, you know, I grew up and got older, we went, I went to college and my cousin was still my best friend, but as we went in different directions, he, you know, we stopped connecting and, and we didn't have cell phones. I know it's hard for you to believe I didn't have a cell phone and, uh, you know, we had this thing called AOL, you know what I'm talking about? And I had instant messenger and it was just weird and so, you know, and so my best friend, uh, who, he was my college roommate. In fact, he's still one of my good friends today. And, and, you know, we hung out together. We did a lot of stuff in college, in Bible school, that's under the blood. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Under the blood. We can't talk about it. We've been sworn to secrecy about everything. Amen. Amen. And so, but one thing he did, which was amazing, is that he introduced me to my wife. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, that's a good friend, a really good friend. He introduced my wife. He actually picked my wife up from the airport in thanks, right around Thanksgiving. My, my, my wife was coming back from Memphis, Tennessee, where, she, where her family lives and her, her father uh, pastors. And so she was coming back, and she was talking and, uh, to Ryan, and Ryan told me, hey, you need to meet this girl. And so I was like, all right. And so I met her, and, 
and she had these nice little curly curls in her hair and big old smile, and, and she, she was just beautiful. Come on, somebody. And I'm talking good about her, and she ain't even in the room. Like, I need some points in this place, you know what I'm saying? Thank you, Jesus. And she, had, she was beautiful inside and out. And, you know, I was in a predominantly black church preaching, and so, you know, she came up to me, and she told me, and this was like, I know it's weird for y'all, but it was like, like heaven for me. She's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm just coming back from Memphis. You know, we had the Kojic Convention. And for people who don't know what Kojic is, that's okay. Y'all don't know, but to me, that was like, in my spirit, I was like, oh, this is my wife. Because for all of us black folk uh, in the room, that means Church of God in Christ. <laughs> you don't know what Kojic is, you, it's okay. You get it tomorrow. She loved gospel music. And she's been my best friend for 17 years. But, but there have been people that have come in and out of our lives. But when Jesus talks about sending us another comforter, another counselor, another advocate, he tells us, see, he uses this word called parakletos, which means para, which means very close. Kletos means calling an assignment, which means that the Holy Spirit has come very close to reveal and to push us into our God-given calling and assignment. How many people are thankful today that the Holy Spirit really is our best friend? That while other people have walked out of our lives because of situations, the Holy Spirit has been ever present in our lives. And it's so important that we recognize when we talk about the comforter, we recognize that he is present. He is present. And when I say comforter, the word comforter comes from the old English word come, which means together, and fort, which means to strengthen. It's not just to pat you on the back to make you feel good, but he has come to strengthen you, to fortify what he has told you, what Jesus has said about you. The Holy Spirit has come to, with an assignment to fortify this truth that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to lie. He wants to deceive. But the Holy Spirit has come to fortify the life that Jesus has promised that I have come to give you life I wish I had a witness and it more abundantly when I talk about presence his presence is present and I'm not talking about that type of presence that's present as in just being there like you're taking class you know because you've been in class where you were present but you really weren't present you know when you go to class they mark you either in three categories present absent or tardy you know what I'm saying even in Bible school you know we would go to class and we would mark present and 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 we would know that if we were smart we could go to the bathroom and because we were marked present in the moment we could actually be absent and yet still be present you forgive me Jesus there are some people who have came into your life and have marked themselves present and have walked out of your life. And even though they think that they are present, they are still absent in your life. I'm not talking about that type of presence. I'm talking about an active presence that when you wanted to walk away, the Holy Spirit still kept on chasing you. That when people walked out of your life, the Holy Spirit was still present. And even the best people and with the best intentions who still weren't, didn't show up in your life, there have been times when I wasn't there for my wife but I am so thankful that the Holy Spirit was ever present he's ever present turn your neighbor and say he's ever present that means he's here not just today on Sunday morning. He's here on Monday. He's here when you're sleeping. He's here when you're walking the, walking the, the hallways uh, at, at midnight. He's there when you're dealing with the problem and you don't know how to solve it. He's, he's there when you got an ache in your body and you don't know how that you're going to be able to make it. And I'm not going to talk about just a physical ache. It can be an emotional ache. It can be a spiritual ache. He is present. Can I tell you, he's present in your thing. And the fact of the matter is if he's in control, Oh, there is nothing out of control. Can I get a witness in the place? Can I tell you today that he is in the room? He's working not just in you. He's working around you. He's working for you. He's working beside you. He's working behind you. He's working on Monday before you even are there on Monday. He's present. I'm talking about the presence of God. I mean, I mean, I love my wife. 
And I've been her best friend and she's been my best friend. But yesterday, 24 hours ago, my wife was driving down 99. Driving down 99, she was coming up to her exit where we get off. And in that area, there is always, it's always been, it's a little loosey-goosey. I don't know why, but I don't know if it's just the grade. But while she was driving, she wasn't driving over the limit. She was driving, probably driving under the limit. And she started to lose control of her vehicle. I mean, I'm not talking about she slipped. I'm talking about she was doing spinning. Completely spinning out of control. She spun out of control, and if you know where, where she was at, you would know that on the right side was an embankment that would cause her to flip the car. In fact, she felt like the car was about to flip. And over to the left, there was, a, was an area that wasn't conducive, but as she slid, she didn't hit a car. She didn't go into an embankment. She said, I don't know what happened, but it seemed as though when I lost control, somebody else took control. No, you didn't hear what I said. You see, there's sometimes I can't be there and be able to help her. But can I tell you the presence of God? Can I tell you that the Holy Ghost, can I tell you he can take the wheel when you lost control of your life. And he can guide you and direct you and move you in places that you didn't think you could get there. I can tell you there is nothing out of control when he's still in control of your life. Can I tell you he is present. Somebody shout, he's present. You need to declare that in your life. You need to let the devil know. No, I'm telling you, the presence of God is present in my life. I may not see him. I may not feel him. But he is present today. And it's important. Because Jesus describes this advocate as the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth declares that you are never alone because I am with you. And when I talk about uh, being alone, it has more to do than just companionship. Because I've been around people that were in the room and, st and still felt lonely. I've been around people, if it was just getting another relationship, I've seen people come out of relationship into another relationship and still feel alone. Because loneliness has nothing to do with companionship. It has everything to do with abandonment. That's why Jesus wanted to declare. He said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you abandoned. But I want you to know today that you are not unwanted. You belong. That's what the spirit of truth declares. You belong. Because the enemy's job is to make us feel rejected. Can I tell you today, the spirit of rejection is one of the most deadliest things in the house of God. Because people have allowed their hurts to become internalized. And because they are in pain, they reject people before they're even rejected. People feel like because of what they went through and because, of, because they didn't have a father and because they were abandoned or because of a situation and because of this happening or because somebody didn't come through when they thought they should come through. They put their faith and expectation in other people. They reject people before they even get rejected you see it all the time somebody you tell them I'm going to call you in a few minutes now you know that's hyperbole you know that is just a way of saying that hey when I get a free moment but people that deal with rejection if you don't call them in a few minutes hello they'll, they'll get upset why did they call me? What, what, they told me they're going to call me in three minutes. What did, I mean, and all of a sudden, and they said, well, I'm, I'm not even going to deal with them no more. They told me they're going to call me in a few minutes, and I might as well just give up on that. But if that's how they're going to be. Now, you're laughing now, but then you get upset over the situation. 
Because when you deal with the spirit of rejection, you reject people before they, you feel like they're going to reject you. You can't even have a good relationship. Somebody walks by you and don't say hi and you got an attitude already. You know why? Because you deal with rejection. And it's because the enemy has lied to you to, to declare that you are unwanted. And I want to break that lie over your spirit today. See, the spirit of truth declares that you belong. You are not a slave coming into the family of God. You are not a stepchild coming into. You are, this is not foster care where we pass you along in the family. You are an heir and join heir with Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave. So that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And because of that, we cry, Abba. Abba, Father. Abba, meaning Daddy God. I mean, when you think of the word Abba, it's the most intimate word you could say. And the spirit of God who lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit, it's his role to fortify this truth that you have the seal of your adoption. He has sealed you today. Now, you don't understand the power of adoption. That when we adopted our girls on April the 29th, 2016, it's the same day as my son's birth. On my gotcha day, as well as my son's birthday, that's the same day that we celebrate our daughters coming into the family. They didn't just have a name change. They didn't just pick up my last name. They didn't just legally change, change direction, which is true. But, but most powerfully, what they did is they recreated a birth certificate. The birth certificate was completely changed, sealed by the state of Tennessee, sealed by the state of Arkansas that declared that not only is this name changed, but now there is also a new name and a new and a, a new name, a new father's name, and a new mother's name on the birth certificate, which declares that that what I was not only has God changed my my destiny, but God has even changed my origin today. That I am not what I once was, because God has brought me into a new creation, and I belong at the table of God. I can come right at the table and pull the chair out and sit down and say, I belong here. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter how people look at you. It doesn't matter what your friends say. It doesn't matter what your family says. Can I tell you, you got a right to sit at the table. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, you got a right to sit at the table. I don't care what kind of eyeball they give you today. I want you to know you can come right in at the table. The Bible says come boldly into the throne room of grace today. I can come right in to my father's chambers and say, God, I need mercy and I need grace and I need hope and I need joy. And the Holy Spirit gives me the truth to know that I belong in this place. I belong. Belonging is powerful because you will never become until you belong. Hello? You'll try to prove something because you don't belong. Come on, turn your neighbors. I don't have to prove nothing. I don't got to impress you. I don't got to show you that I'm part of the family. The fact of the matter is God tells me I'm his child. Mm -hmm. Whether you have a problem or not, you're going to have to get over it. If you, if you don't like me, yeah, you're going to have to start liking me because I'm going you better get used to me because I'm sitting at the table. Come on, somebody. Come on. I belong here. I belong here. The Holy Spirit gives me this powerful truth. Not only does he declare that I am wanted, but he also declares that I am loved. You are not unloved. And I give this double negative because the enemy always tries to make us feel like we are unloved. You're loved. You are loved. God made you unique. Hello. God made you different. He made you with your gifting and your 
calling on your life. He made you tenacious. He made you with a strong will. He made you in, in, in specificity to be like no other. And it's important because you need to know God loves you. Like church folk, we get it, but we don't get it. Because here's the truth. We love people based on how we receive love. Like, like if you start acting funny towards me, I'm probably going to start acting funny back. Can we keep it real? Can we? Because our love is conditional. Right? Like, we're going to, like, like, we're going to tolerate you, but I mean, I mean, I'm, hey. Because we base our love based on how we receive love. Right? And that is the humanistic type of love. But when God loves you, he doesn't love you based on your condition. He actually loves you based on unconditioned he loves you because he is love and he cannot not love you in fact the bible says he loves you so much that the same amount of love he has for you now that you're on this side of the cross is the same amount when it was before you were saved that while you were yet sinners christ died for them that means god loved me when i was a mess I, God loved me when I walked away. God loved me when I was unfaithful. God loved me when I cursed his name. God loved me when I didn't do right and I knew I wasn't doing right. God loved me when I was doing some things behind closed doors. Come on, somebody. And God didn't stop loving me like other people wanted to stop loving me. God kept on chasing me while I was running away from him. He said, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to chase you all the way down. I'm going to follow you all the way to the end. I'm not going to let you go. My arm's not too short and my ear's not too heavy. And if the moment that you stop, I'm going to arrest your soul. I'm going to grab your heart because God's love is that powerful. It's the embrace of the Father's love. And the, the Bible tells us that, that the Holy Spirit, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We can't even imagine, imagine or fathom the depth, the, the, the height, the breadth, the width of God's love towards us. But when we receive the presence of the Holy Spirit, he changes the way we love because we are loved. We love differently because we are loved. You cannot give something you don't have. But when you know your love today, when you know that you're, 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 the child, you're a child of God today and you're the apple of God's eye, that God loves you unconditionally, that you, you know that in your heart, it changes the way you love other people. It's his presence. It changes. You're not unwanted. You're not unloved. The enemy wants to put shame on you today. He's telling you, why are you coming to church? You know what you did last night. Hello? Hello? Mm-hmm. Hello? You know what you said last week? You know how you acted in traffic? Mm-hmm. With your Christian bumper sticker. Come on, you did. Yeah, we know what you did with the finger. Oh, don't act like you didn't do nothing wrong. Hello? Well, you know, we, uh, you, but God doesn't put shame on you. Because you are loved, he takes shame off of you. See, the role of the enemy is to put shame off. On you, He wants to cause you to believe that you are not worthy, that you are not good enough, that you are not enough today. And God won't love you because of what you did. But God loves you in spite of what you did, in spite of what you said, in spite of how you acted, in spite of everything you've done. God still, and he takes the shame off of you. Not shame on you today, shame off of you. Shame off of your life, shame off of your marriage, shame off of your family. God's the God that takes shame off of you because of his love. The Father's embrace takes the shame off of you. He's not just present. If it was just him being present, that'd be enough. 
But he's not just present. He's a partner. He said in John 15, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant doesn't know his master's business. He said, I've called you friends. For everything I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you. And appointing you so that you would might go and bear fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my love. This is my command. Love each other. Then he says in verse 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And that lets me know today that in his partnership, you are not hopeless. The spirit of truth declares that you are chosen. God declares that I'm not treating you like a slave. I'm not treating you just like a hireling. I'm making you a part of the partnership of my kingdom. And now you are a friend. And I, wanna, I want you to see through the eyes of my spirit and let you understand that I have plans for you. And these plans are to bring significance into your life. Because you didn't choose me, I chose you. The spirit of truth declares that you are chosen. Can I tell you today that you are chosen by God to do more than just suck air? Come on, somebody. To do more than just warm the pew. To do more than just clock in and clock out Monday through Friday. To do more than just wipe rear ends and take care of clothes, mothers, and just take care of the family and deal with this problem. And deal. you do. God has chosen you for more than you can imagine or think. I need to declare to you that there is more inside of you than you can even imagine. And if you would allow the partner to show himself in your life, the Holy Spirit, he will declare to you that he has a calling on your life, a kletos on your life, that there is a purpose on your life, that you were made on purpose for purpose this morning. And you will never do what God calls you to do until you believe you were called to do it. Let me say that again. You will never do what God calls you to do until you believe you were called to do it. Can I tell you today, you are called by God this morning. Don't let nobody lie to you. Don't let the devil tell you that you are not chosen, that you are not God's, God's mandate on the earth. God has a calling on your life. You need to believe that. You need to be in a stand up and declare. Claire, look yourself in the mirror and said, I am chosen. God got a calling, an assignment on my life today, and I'm going to fulfill the calling of God. I'm more than just a man. I'm more than just a preacher. God's got a purpose on my life, and because I believe it, I'm going to walk and see what God's going to do in my life. I'm chosen. I'm chosen by God. And what, what I love about it is, is that when it's just like a seed. I, I, I forgot my seed. If I had my seed, I, I'd show you. It, inside the seed has all of the potential for everything it'll ever be. And too many of you all are living with untapped potential. You're like the seed, but you're not planting. And can I tell you when you get planted on purpose? When you get planted... Let me just say, you get planted in purpose, on purpose, it'll change the way you live. It'll change the way you act. It'll change the way you look at Monday. You won't look at miserable Monday. You'll be looking at this magnificent Monday because I was called. I was called for this hour. I said, I was called for this hour. In fact, all through the time and all through the lineage of all of the eras and all of the, all of the, all of the dispensations, God called me for this time. But see, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right time. I'm, in, I'm the right person today. You're messing with me. You're messing with the wrong person. Because if God be for me, who can stand against me? I'm chosen. Do you hear me what I said? I said, I'm chosen. I was appointed by God to do what I'm called to do. And, and no devil in hell, no, no hater, no, no, no backs. 
backbiter is going to stop what God called me to do. I got a purpose on my life. I got, I got plans. I got plans. I, God's got plans on me. He got plans on my life. I don't know about your life, but God's got some plans. And he, he said, uh, the plans that I have are for a hope and a future. And God's got an expected end. And the end is going to be successful and significant. Hello? Hello? Chosen. When you know you're chosen, hey, you, you walk different. You walk in like you own the place. Who does he think he is? Acting like he owns the place. You do. do you know who I am? I am a child of the spirit of truth declares that I have been chosen by him. Hello? If God didn't want me here, he'd move me. But since I'm here, it's a sign that God placed me here. And if God placed me here, nothing can stop what God wants me to do. Nothing can stop what God wants me to do. I said nothing can stop what God wants me to do. There's some fruit that he wants me to bear. I'm chosen. I'm chosen. God chose us. We are bad. We dynamic. Chosen. I got everybody that God wanted me to marry. He picked somebody from, from, from Memphis that was chosen. I, I didn't find my wife. God found my wife and chose her to be my boo. Come on, baby. Be my baby's mama. You, when you understand the providence of God, you understand how the Holy Spirit works. He's in partnership. There is no accidents with the Holy Ghost. Like God orders my steps. Do you understand that? I, it didn't happen by accident. It happened by providence because I'm, I'm walking with God. And he said, when I open up doors, no man can shut it. Can I, can I tell you, when God's on your side, who can be against you? I'm chosen. You didn't pick that job. God picked that job. And if God wanted you to have something else, he'll give you something else. But I'm going to work what I got because I'm chosen. That's what the Spirit of truth declares. The Holy Spirit produces significant. He said, I chose you to bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. It means you're not hopeless. You're going to be fruitful. When you are in partnership with the Holy Spirit, you can't help but produce fruit. Because there's life flowing inside of your veins. There's life flowing inside of your home. There's life flowing inside of your family. You can't help but have kids that walk in the admonition of the Lord. Because you are chosen by God. Even the ones that go out still have to come back right. Come on. I just can't wait. To see what God does with my kids' kids. Lord Jesus. Chosen. There's fruit in your life. And at last, it makes eternal impact. You're an agent of change and transformation. And not only are you not hopeless, you're not helpless. This is the most important statement because the spirit of truth declares that you are in partnership. God is not going to leave you out of the dark. Hello, have you ever been in a situation where you were kept out of the dark? Man, I thought we were friends. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like you get the announcement on Facebook and you're like, wait a minute. Why didn't you call me? I got the public announcement that you're having a baby. I thought we were. Thank you. Thank you. Getting off my chest. When you have friendship, when you have partnership, God lets you know you are not walking this by yourself. You are not helpless. It's not necessarily that you have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has you in partnership. And because of that, the power of the Spirit gives you supernatural. Supernatural, whatever you need. 
I don't know about you. Have you ever been in a place where you needed something? Can I get a witness? Just talk to me. And I ain't got, everybody got, y'all self-sufficient. Y'all got it together. You got, you got plenty of money. You got plenty of, plenty of account. You don't got nothing. Anybody ever need some help? Can, can I, no, I need to pray for some broken arm. Anybody need some help? Can I tell you what the Holy Spirit can do? He is more than enough for your life. Can I tell you, turn your neighbor and say, he's more than enough. I mean, he's more, he's a teacher in the classroom of life. Can I tell you, if you don't know what to do, can I tell you, he's a teacher this morning. He's a lawyer in the courtroom. You, you got a legal battle. You got a fight. You don't know what to do. Can I tell you, he's an advocate. He can, he can fight your battles. He can stand beside you. He can plead your case before the throne of grace. Can I, can I get a witness? He's an advocate. He's a lawyer in the court. He's a physician in the operating room. You got doctors that can do certain things, but can I tell you what the Holy Ghost can do? He's a physician. He can heal. He can mend. He can correct. He can bring diagnosis that you didn't understand. He's a physician in the operating room. Can I tell you? He's a counselor in the crossroads of life. You don't know where to go. You don't know where to turn. You don't know who's for you. You know, can I tell you? He's a counselor this morning. He can give you counsel on where to go and when to go and how to go. He's a counselor in the crossroads of a life. He's a door opener. I said he's a door opener. I said he's a door opener. In the realm of impossible situations, uh, in the realm of a hallways of transition, can I tell you, he's a door opener this morning. You don't know what door to go to, can I tell you, he'll open the door. Just wait and watch what God will do. Just as you knock, uh, watch what God will do. He'll open up a door. He's a banker. Can I, anybody need a banker in the realm of, in, uh, in the realm of finance? Can I tell you, he's a, he's a banker. He can provide. He said, my God shall supply all of your needs. Uh, listen, he's not like Prosperity Bank. Uh, he's not like Bank of America that's going to charge interest. Uh, he said, what I have, I'm going to give freely to you. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. He's a banker. He'll teach you how to manage. Uh, he'll teach you how to steward. Watch him work. He's a banker. Can I tell you today, he's a peace giver. This is the best part. He's a peace giver. In chaos, in turmoil, in trouble, in transition, he's the God that'll give you peace. You won't lose your mind. You won't react. You won't be fearful. You won't be overwhelmed. You won't be anxiety. You won't be depressed. He's a peace giver. He said, I'll give you peace, supernatural peace that'll guard your heart and your mind. Listen, while the world is going crazy, you're going to have a sound mind. He said, I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. He's a God that's a peace giver this morning. Can I tell you today, he's not just a peace giver, he's a, a compass today, an uncharted territory. He's a burden bearer in the moment of affliction. He's a deliverer in the time of, of persecution. And he's an empower. And an empower. He'll give you the power to do what you couldn't do in your own ability. What do you mean you're helping? You and God make up the majority this morning. Come on, Sam. I'm past my time. But you need to look your neighbor in the eyeball and tell him, you're not helpless. You need to talk to somebody that wants to talk back and tell them, say, you are not helpless. You're not helpless this morning. You're not helpless. Come on, tell somebody, you're not helpless. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. The Spirit of the living God, the advocate, the Spirit of truth, the counselor, the comforter has come to strengthen you, to tell you that you are not helpless. Stop laying yourself down. Stop falling down. Start picking yourself up today knowing that God is with you. And if God is with you, God is also for you. And if God be for us, who can stand against us? Can I get a witness in this room? Can I declare that? neither height nor depth nor angels nor demon nor past nor present nor anything shall be able to separate me from the love of God because I'm not helpless I'm not helpless and I'm not hopeless and I am I'm chosen I'm chosen to do supernatural things 
You've been living life in your ability. Could you imagine what you could do in his ability? Take the limits off. That's what I hear the Holy Spirit say. Take the limits off. Come on. I said take the limits off. Stop putting God in a box. Quit, quit trying to calculate what God can do. Quit trying to lo get logic to figure out how God. God can take two fish and five loaves and feed five. God can turn water into water. God can take a dead man that's been dead for four days and command it to come up out of the grave. And the man start hopping out of the grave. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a God who took six days to make the heavens and the earth. Take the limits off God. I mean, I believe some crazy stuff. Like, I believe he can still heal. Like, I believe he can still deliver. I believe with one power out of his presence, he can change an addict into a, to a, to a preacher, to a, to a communicator of the power of God. Can I tell you, he's a wonder-working God. 